have to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. But now there are new terms coming into the game. Freedom energy, energy independence, turning point of history. And these point to a change which is triggered by the Russian invasion into Ukraine. And in, this the, in the core of this change is also solar. It has led to more ambitious targets for PV deployment and expansion and for the energy transition in total. And in this session we will dive into the we, we will dive into the question how we can make these ambitious targets targets real. Because we already heard this, this concern of industry that it's not so easy to ramp up installation rates and supply so fast. And this session, we talk about this and the hurdles, but the challenges in total are much more manifold. So, you know, energy transition is complex. And this year's PV Magazine's Roundtable Europe will tackle these questions. I think it, the challenges we face are reflected really well by the 10 sessions and the topics of the 10 sessions which we have prepared for today and tomorrow. Well, Mikael, it's not only challenges, there's also great opportunities for the PV industry and we'll be discussing those over the next two days also. There's about 60 expert speakers who have been assembled, as Mikael said, across 10 different panels, 10 different sessions. The editors of PV Magazine have been deeply involved in planning all of those and they're really addressing the most relevant aspects as to what our industry can contribute, which challenges it has to address and what it can or has to do if we are to meet these energy transition targets, which are now underpinned increasingly by policy. Let's take you through now the, these 10 sessions. The first one, of course, Mikael and my colleague Emiliano Bellini will be taking you through in just a few moments. But then later on today, we have uh, session two is sustainability in practice, where we look at ESG rules, investment regulations, and what the solar industry can do to meet this ever rising bar of expectations in terms of ESG. The session three is how to decarbonize homes today. It pretty much does what it says on the tin. We're looking at the residential space and uh, the role that solar can play in deep decarbonization of homes of all shapes and sizes, including smart energy management, an important part of the equation there. Session four is building up and uh, build, bulking up and building out, my apologies, which is our Made in Europe session, looking at solar manufacturing in Europe, which technologies, policies, investments need to be made to reestablish Europe as a PV manufacturing base. Then we have PV on wheels, session five, which is looking at the fast emerging space of solar electric vehicles and VIPV, v vehicle integrated photovoltaics for vehicles of all shapes and sizes. Also a lot of diversity there in a really cutting edge space. On our second day tomorrow, we'll have Solar Everywhere, which is looking at novel PV applications such as floating PV, even beyond uh, the, the shoreline, even going out into the sea, agri-PV, and uh, we'll also be uh, looking at BIPV, um, a space that has really underperformed over the years but will become increasingly important here in Europe. Session seven, so the second session of the second day, will be deploying high efficiency. We know there's a lot of high efficiency cells coming into the market, how are we going to see these modules incorporated into PV projects in Europe in the near future? Now, quality has also always been a key part of our roundtables program. Mikael, you'll be hosting yeah. the next, next session about quality. I still remember the first roundtables we have started 2015 was quality. And quality is an ever-relevant topic for solar industry because if the quality is not correct, is not sufficient, then the business numbers are not sufficient. And that means that we don't have the business, we don't have the expansion. So this year quality session we call model design choices and reliability because there are different ways you can set up models, particularly also uh, we can choose different sizes of wafers. We will have a look on this. We will have a look also on the quality of yield prognosis and particularly on the data and the specifications behind and um, which we see that they really give an uncertainty to the business makers and the, the, um, when they have to select the right modules. And on the business side, we will have in the ninth session um, the PP we will shed light on the PPA, the Power Purchase Agreement Market. It's a great opportunity because it gives the chance to really expand solar without subsidies. But we already see now that the cannibalization risk take, uh, plays a bigger role, a, c a continuously bigger role. 
already now 20% of the, of the revenue is decreased because of the cannibalization. The effect is known for years. If all solar installations produce at the same time, then the electricity produced by them loses, uh, on, uh, loses value. And the, there are ways around it, there's, but it's a risk. And how to share these risks among the players of the PPA business model, that is a really relevant point when we talk about expansion in this unsubsidized, uh, unsubsidized solar business model. One way to tackle cannibalization is through hydrogen production and storage. And this will be the topic of the 10th sec session, so the last session tomorrow. And with the hydrogen business models, we have a hand and egg problem. We need, off-takers need cheap hydrogen, but to get cheap hydrogen, you need a scale. And the question is how to get the scale. Tomorrow we will discuss this with a representative of cement industry, potential off-taker, they need a lot of hydrogen, and with a representative of an investment fund who is financing hydrogen and solar hydrogen projects to see what criteria project developers have to fulfill in order to get financing already now and scale up the production. Well, it's a very diverse program, 10 sessions over two days. Without further ado, Michael, I'll uh, leave the stage to you and let's get on with Roundtables Europe 2022. Oh, but before we do that, indeed, our, uh, our most important uh, sponsors and partners for this event. We, we have to, um, we really work very closely with our partners in putting on our roundtables as we have over the years, as Mikhail uh, pointed to. So a very big thank you to our lead partner, Trina Solar, and to our platinum partners, Axpo, Jinko Solar, Longi, Seraphin Solar, Smart Energy, Solar Edge, Studer Cables, and Wave Labs. And let's not also forget our gold sponsors, which you can also see on this slide. Forgot the sponsors. Not a great start, but we've got a great program <laughs> ahead, Michael. And great sponsors. <laughs> Indeed, and great sponsors. I'll let you take it away. How to realize ambitious goals given by policymakers to the PV industry to expand the PV installations. Just to give you an impression from Germany. In Germany, there is a new government since last autumn. It's a solar-friendly government. It's, it's supportive of the industry. I hear that quite often that, that really changed it, changed because we haven't had that for years. And then, triggered by the Russian invasion into Ukraine, means quadruple the installation rates from 2021 to 2026, so from now on in four, four years from below 6 gigawatts to 22 gigawatts annually. And we will discuss in this session on the European level what, what the targets are on the European level. Are they as challenging and how to really realize these targets? There are a lot of roadblocks to really to overcome and there is also the supply chain issue, obviously, because we all know that um, at the moment there is also a shortage in supply. At least sometimes we have logistical problems. It will all be part of this session. And we would have expected or we plan to have an interview here with Oliver Krischer, Secretary of State of the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Um, he has a lot of success. This means he is becoming minister in North Rhine-Westphalia, which is the most populated, populated state of Germany. And he will become that by tomorrow. And that's why he apologized that he cannot be here. And we jump directly to our panel, which I think we have great panelists from the policy side, from the manufacturing side, from the project developing side, to see what are the targets and how we can make them happen. Emiliano, you have prepared the panel. Yeah, let's meet them and let's introduce first Moritz Bormann, which is CCO at Meyer Burger. Hi, Moritz. Welcome to the panel. Hello. Good morning. Hey, Moritz, is, am I correct if I say that um, Meyer Burger is a big European manufacturer? I mean, one of those European manufacturers that want to reach a certain scale to compete better with Asian companies? Yes. In fact, we are currently the biggest uh, manufacturer of uh, PV cells and panels in Europe. And let me also introduce Pablo Collado, which is CEO for Northern and, Euro and uh, Central Europe at Iberdrola. Hi, Pablo. Welcome to the, the, to the panel. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. 
Pablo, when it comes to renewables, uh, can we define uh, Iberdrola an EPC contractor or a, a, a project developer, an asset owner? I mean, the company is active across several several segments. Yeah, I think that Iberdrola is a global utility, and we are uh, probably in the whole value chain of the renewables uh, spectrum. So from greenfield development to owning the asset, retailing the energy. So uh, definitely a global player in the industry. And we also have Dries Acker, which is policy director at Solar Power Europe. Hi, Dries, welcome. Thanks for having me. Good morning, everybody. Dries, let me, let me begin with you, because we have a very important uh, question about the targets. The EU is considering 600 gig gigawatt of solar by 2030 and 320 gigawatt by to 2025. Are these targets ambitious, ambitious enough? Well, let's first talk about the numbers, uh, as you mentioned. Yeah? So before we power EU, the goal for solar was around 400 gigawatts in DC, I expressed. Uh, and now that has basically doubled to 750 gigawatts expressed in DC again, um, which means an annual installation rate around 60 gigawatts per year. Uh, so is that ambitious? Well, it's a relative concept. Yeah. Um, we are in a world where these goals are just kind of plain necessary as well not just from a climate point of view, but also from a security point of view. Let's not forget that, yeah? The commission has increased the targets as part of its Repower EU plan, which is at its core, a security, an energy security plan. So Repower EU is not necessarily a climate plan. So I should also say that as a solar industry, uh, Solar Power Europe and its members believe that an ambition is actually possible of one terawatt by 2030. So obviously, these goals are higher. It has doubled in its ambition, but they are achievable according to our industry, and they're just plain necessary from a climate and a security point of view. Would you say that this, this one terawatt would be technically and economically achievable, Dries? Absolutely. We have done this analysis with the LUT uh, University together with our members. Yeah, we represent the whole supply chain of the solar industry in Europe. And together we have come to that conclusion. So that conclusion is backed up not just by energy modeling, but also by the industrial players that we represent in our membership. So two good reasons to believe and to be able to talk about that, so that this ambition is absolutely possible. And Pablo, what should be done to see this growth materialize? I mean, which, which are the steps which, which, which we could see over the next years? Well, I think that definitely that the, the, the issue is going to be in the in the permitting side. I think that the the availability for lands and uh, and the permitting processes within the countries are going to be the, the limits for the installation. I, I do agree that the the targets are ambitious and they are technically and economically achievable. And uh, all the companies, uh, we are ready to go. We are really happy to invest the money. Um, but but there are, I mean, licensing procedures are probably too long and too complex in some occasions in order to achieve uh, these targets. So I think that this is the, the focus that the countries need to take in the following months. This is, this is urgent. Andres, let's take the example of Germany, which uh, Michael uh, made before. Germany had six gigawatt last year, and it should install 22 gigawatt in 2026 um, as, a, as an annual deployment. Do you really see this as, as an easy task to, uh, to achieve? Given the current uh, supply chain issues, uh, skill force, uh, workforce, and skilled labor, these are yeah. problems that we're seeing now. Yeah. I think that you, you put on the table the other two issues, no? which is uh, um, access to, to talent. I think that there's going to be a scarcity on the on the, on the market channels that can lead this this way um, and of course supply chain i mean we're living <coughs> in uh, uh, issues with the transportation with the access to the supply chain that's going to be an issue but again i think that the limits are going to come mainly from the, the from the permitting from the fact that we want to to advance but um all these big targets that we are talking at, at brussels level or at country level, are very difficult to be transferred to the municipality, to the local authorities, that at the end of the day, 
have a lot of power in the decision of when and how all these projects have to be online. So um, I think that there is a mismatch in the objectives that the country as a whole have, and then the local municipalities live on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that, that that's where the, 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 the issues come, no? Um, there are projects that are broken into several parts. There are local authorities that are thinking more on the re-election in, in eight bonds rather than the energetic issue globally in Europe. Andres, do you agree that permitting is the biggest issue or one of the biggest ones? It certainly is uh, certainly a top, a top uh, obstacle. Um, and that is also something what uh, the person from Iberdrola was saying. There's a difference between the European levels that need to trickle down to national level goals. But then again, this needs to trickle down as well to the local uh, site where a lot of this permitting is actually happening and a lot of this spatial planning is happening. And there we indeed see a bit of a, a disconnect. Yeah, uh, The national goals are not really developed in cooperation with the local municipalities and there's a, bizarre, uh, there's a disconnect. Um, one of the main obstacles that we identified is actually around just the, the, the quantity and the quality of staff, of people, of administrative people in the local permitting and uh, municipalities that are able and knowledgeable enough to deal with these permitting uh, uh, rules and, and complexities. That's why Solar Power Europe has joined an, an initiative from the Energy Cities Network to really work to invest in coaching and training and staffing of locally skilled administrative staff. And Moritz, we will talk about uh, um, supply chain issues in the final part of the panel. Maybe you can say something now just to, to let our uh, uh, public understand how much uh, supply issues are, are, are difficult now and could be over the next years. Um, well, I mean, currently we are, of course, in exceptional circumstances and we all um, hope and believe that uh, things will improve in the next couple of years. But I think the big picture is that all of us shouldn't be under the illusion that panels are just gonna magically appear and fall from the sky. So they need to be manufactured somewhere. And I think while Europe uh, is thinking hard about its um, energy policy and security policy and how this uh, can be secured by renewable energy, we should also be thinking really hard about where those panels should actually come from. And of course, our opinion is very clear, at least a major chunk of that uh, amount of panels should come, come from Europe. We will come to this topic in the in the later section of this panel, um, just to conclude what, what we have heard so far. I mean, we have heard on one hand from trees that it's possible to reach these goals. I mean, six, you said 60 gigawatt annual installation rate in Europe. It's, it's quite on the same level than what we have heard from Germany. Um, so it's really a big challenge, I think. And you say it's possible, but we have also heard, yeah, but we have to do something for that. And this is what we want to tackle this. And we have researched examples before when we prepared this panel. We examples of cases which shed light on which topics we have to discuss fast and we have to solve and we have to handle with, project developers have to handle with. So we will present you now a video insert, a short video interview with, from, with an example from Germany <coughs> and which I think is not so difficult, uh, not, not so different in other European countries. And that will give us the question, the, 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 the show us a challenge which we then want to discuss. Obstacles in Germany. Limited grid connection is a main obstacle for planning uh, bigger solar parks in Germany. Um, for example, there are regions where the DSO is saying uh, it's only about uh, 500 megawatts left uh, uh, at grid capacity. And yeah, um, if you want to plan uh, a 100 megawatt uh, park, uh, the problem is you cannot connect to the 110 kilowatt level. So, uh, the DSO is saying you need a transmission uh, grid uh, operator connection with additional costs, with additional processes, and this is not feasible for a uh, 100 megawatt park. Or installation um, of uh, 300, 400 or more megawatts or clusters of those parks, it can be feasible yeah, uh, and economic to connect them at the transmission grid. Uh, but uh, we need to have a focus on improving the 
uh, distribution grid as well. Yeah. How many projects are in the process of securing permits? Huh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I monitor uh, a lot uh, what the DSOs are saying, but uh, it's a real problem that there is no uh, specialized agency who, uh, who monitors that. Why is permitting so difficult? The, the uh, installations of solar parks is mainly focused on the EEG discussion yeah? and the, uh, the things we learned in the past 10 years. But things are changed. Yeah? Uh, we build bigger parks, we build parks somewhere else uh, um, and we do not have the right processes to um, yeah to permit them in uh, in the time necessary yeah are there any other big challenges for project developers yeah there are lots I uh, highlight uh, another topic it's the stuffing problem of regional authorities and um, this is a problem because uh, the capacity of the regional authorities are uh, in municipalities or, for example, in nature conservation authorities are not staffed uh, adequately. Uh, I thought that probably that you probably you are familiar with grid limitation problems, and my question is. Do you have also maybe recommendations? How, what can project developers do? Um, maybe you can show that also. Do you have an example for this? I mean, I think that, that uh, more than project developers do is the, the administration. I fully agree on this. Uh, again, the, the, this mismatch about global, national, or even um, Europe objectives, and then local municipalities or small um, environmental agencies taking decisions which are completely understaffed and uh, could have, again, different objectives. So I think there are some examples of success. Uh, we can have the case of uh, Andalusia in the south of Spain. Um, they created these strategic projects agencies uh, which acted as a single point of contact for us, for developers, and they were managing internally all the different administrations I, I in think, the process. I, I, I think we want, Pablo, I think we want to come to these sort of examples later because there also Emiliano has brought okay. another example. But the question is grid limitations, restrictions by grid access. Is that something what you also yeah. see? And how do you deal with grid problems? Okay, I mean, of course, the, the, the limitations are there. And I think that beyond the limitations is also the lack of visibility. I mean, you can start developing an area, but you don't really know if at the end of the process, you're gonna have access to the network and um, not only access, but feasible access. Uh, for example, we have some projects in, in Germany which are ready to build or are going to be ready to build in the following months. And uh, the, the early conversations with the grid um, administrator is, you're going to have access in 2025 or 2026. So there's a huge also mismatch between the, the planning of the grid and the, the project developers. We should have more visibility in advance. But, but so we can just, have to, more just, to, just, to, just to clarify that, is it the physical limitation of the grid? So is, it, is there really the physical, uh, the, the physical limitation or is, has it also more to do with bureaucracy and administrative um, situation? I think, I think both. I think that there is a, a real physical limitation, but this physical limitation can easily be uh, solved with some uh, investments, not major investment on the grid. The problem is that we are not on the same uh, pressure situation. I mean, the grid operator and the project developers mm. Uh, because we are in a hurry, we want to put our, our wind farms or our uh, solar farms online, but then the grid operator has probably other um, objectives or other priorities. Yeah. That, is a point where I, where, that is a point where I really would like to know 
Dries' opinion, because I mean, you are in discussion also with the Commission in Brussels. Um, is that something you discuss, and is there a solution to that? I mean, it, for me, it sounds a bit. I mean, if there's fiscal limitations, we need good expansion. I mean, if there are not the lines, then the good operators cannot cannot give the access. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. The grid reinforcement is really an essential part of the story, both on the transmission level, but also on the distribution level, as, uh, as Pablo has been saying. And let me focus on that because we really project that 70% of the new solar will come online on the distribution grids. Uh, and that's really something to dive into a little bit deeper. There is a fundamental problem with the rules, yeah, with the incentive schemes for distribution system operators which is not incentivizing smart investments like operational flexibility op covering uh, operational expenditure and is actually very much focused to capital ex uh, intensive investments in more copper in the ground I, I think it now leads to far to really yeah. go into detail on, on this maybe it's really just one sentence is that gonna change yes that's gonna change when <laughs> So there is a very active conversation about network okay. codes for demand okay. side flexibility. There's a new DSO entity in Brussels. I think that's important to know. The DSOs are being organized the way that DSOs are also organized. So you finally have a more stable partner to talk to. Okay. At level. That is an optimistic, uh, optimistic end of this discussion. I just really also one or two sentences maybe from, from Moritz because you are for, in this discussion a bit an outsider because you're a manufacturing industry. I mean, we know that both, we, we have heard that it's maybe too expensive to go to the high voltage lines, but we also know that project developers can earn quite well at the moment because I mean the electricity prices are high. So it, it's not, is it really, do you think it's really economic problem at the end? You should not complain so much, maybe. You mean from the project developer point of yeah, view? Yeah, maybe it's that. No, yeah, I mean, when you look on this discussion, I mean, we also know that project developers have a quite good business model at the moment, at least, because electricity prices are so high. Um, do you think we should complain so much, or is it there will be solutions? I think there, there will be solutions, and uh, the question is, of course, ultimately, Will the project developers have the upper hand or will, for example, the landowners have the upper hand because that's going to be the limitation. So, um, you know, simply from a microeconomics point of view, uh, we have sort of uh, temporal distortions in the market. And uh, but overall, I think that the market is going to work it out um, also in this industry. OK, now we come to next case, which Emiliano has researched in France. Emiliano, what is the point? Exactly as we investigated uh, what, happened, what is happening in France with permitting, we see that it's not easy to get a, a solar park approved in France. And uh, one main issues, a main issue is conflicting agencies. When municipal, regional or national authorities, they don't find an agreement on if a solar park must be approved or not. And this may delay a project for, for, for many months or even years. Um, so, Dries, my question would be, what should be done to avoid this, that we have conflicting uh, entities uh, that have to approve a solar park? Yeah, we touched upon this uh, before um, on the previous uh, in a pre previous minute. So there is a bit of a disconnect yeah, when it goes to, to big ambitions and, and actually uh, enabling uh, the local authorities to, uh, to deal with that. Now, if you take a step back, a lot of this comes down to communicating with society in general about the need for the energy transition. Somehow the permitting or the slow processes are more like a symptom of a deeper root cause. So I think it is important as well for the European Union the Commission, as well as the member states, to really embrace the need to explain what we're actually doing, set those goals, but also argue and justify why we are doing that. And I believe once that is more understood and embraced, some of these complex bottlenecks will there will be a political will and a political context to solving them. Uh, so I think that that shouldn't be forgotten. We shouldn't be kind of dragged into a rabbit hole of specificities on the ground, but actually also sometimes take a step back, say like, why are we encountering these issues? What is the drive as a society to actually support the energy transition? But risk the complexities should be reduced if you want to achieve 600 gigawatt or one terawatt. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, in some cases, it's really too complex. We have seen some cases where the, the developer in, does, doesn't find a, a way out. It doesn't know to which agency it should uh, refer to when it comes to the final approval. 
Oh yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it. But it's in the end, it is a, a matter of political headspace around the priority as a society. The fact that there's too little staff on the local level, not knowledgeable about what's happening, is a choice. Yeah, that a society. So if it reaches, if it increases in priority, and in visibility and in importance, then these things will will be tackled as well. So that's what we're working on, of course. I think that's a, that's a collective uh, responsibility. And Pablo, the European Union and also France is thinking about creating one-stop shops, which are sort of, uh, let's say, uh, organs that should unify the proceedings for approving the solar parks. Have you had experience with similar institutions uh, so far? Yeah, I was actually mentioning that, no? that uh, that uh, was quite successful in, in in the south of Spain, where they created this agency for strategic projects, and uh, they decided that solar projects were definitely strategic. So they managed all the behind the scenes, the different regulators, with the different municipalities, local authorities, and that was really useful and powerful because uh, there was a clear interest in the administration to make that happen. They were also managing communication, which, uh, as has been said, is very, very important because we need people to embrace um, a PV installation as part of the energy transition. Uh, if not, people in the small town halls are going to put a lot of pressure on mayors and, and, and municipal administrators, and they're going to be very, very reactive. So um, having this kind of strategic projects, agencies, or somehow one shot, shot that, that, that's actually perfect, yeah. So this, is, this works out, but do you see this happening in many European countries? Or is it the exception, or is it uh, the, the rule? Uh, how, how, what think, should we do to, to create more uh, one-stop shops across Europe? It's, uh, it has been an exception, and uh, I, don't know, I don't know how easy it's going to be, no? because uh, we know Europe, and we know how we are organized in Europe, and... Um, local states and municipalities have a lot of power. So uh, I think that it's a big challenge in terms of um, uh, governments to now uh, have an agency that uh, has power beyond the local authorities and so on. So uh, I don't think that it's easy. I'm not very, very positive and optimistic on that, but I think that we have to get to that place somehow. I mean, I would be interested when I hear this, I mean, Tracy had in discussion with the European Union on this. Does it really trigger developments at national level if you discuss that in Brussels? Well, the yes, problem is that from the moment... Sorry, I mean, please. No, it's also OK. What's your opinion on this? <laughs> no, my opinion yep. is that uh, when we start discussing with Europe, until we see a real impact on the local municipality, it's so long that uh, I, I don't know if we, if we have time for a formal process. I think that we have to do something in between, as we did in Andalusia, to tackle the issue and then in parallel work at uh, Brussels. Maybe only a very short comment by Tris because you have to come to your next example. Yes, yes. So, but maybe Tris, yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. So the the, the one-stop shops uh, were written into European law many years ago, at least five years ago in the previous renewables directive. So in that sense, this, this, this is already implemented. Now what we see is that it doesn't help with the speed, with the acceleration of the procedure. It's just a one-stop shop to kind of file, but it doesn't necessarily deal with the core issue, which is the speed and the focus and the attention that needs to be given to uh, speed it up. And that's what the European Commission is now looking at, yeah, because they've understood that it's not just an centralization, but it's more like an acceleration in problem. Yeah. Okay, I think, Emiliano, it's time to go to Italy. Exactly. Which our is next, next example, where we have also prepared a video interview with. Exactly. Italy is also having issues with the permitting. It, the things are slightly improving, but still it's, it's going to be a, a real challenge to get a, a solar park approved there. But we have found an interesting case, and it's uh, an agreeable take. And uh, so let's launch a video and see what, uh, which case we have. Challenge. My client uh, is uh, developing uh, many PV plants in the south of Italy. And uh, in uh, our specific uh, case, uh, it was uh, developing a plant in the region Puglia of about uh, 70 megawatts. 
Did the project secure all permits? At the end of 2021, we had a, neg a negative decision by the region Puglia that was granted just on the fact that uh, the landscape planning did not uh, allow the use of the agricultural soil for uh, the PV plants and that there were too many PV plants in this, uh, in this area. Even though your client planned an agri-PV project, Specifically, the project was a project that combined agriculture and production of energy. And this was stressed during the procedure by my client. You went to court. What was the ruling? The, the court ruled that the decisions of the provinces have uh, to consider uh, the specific features of the projects and especially have to consider whether the use of the soil was mitigated uh, by the combination of agriculture and production of, of energy. What does this mean for the future? This means uh, that uh, as a general rule, uh, the next procedures that will be run by the provinces in Puglia will have to take into consideration the need to verify case by case the, the specific projects and not deny them on the basis of the general principles of the landscape planning. So you have to take into consideration also the good environmental uh, action of the PV plants. Now the Ministry of the Ecological Transition will issue a decree, the burden sharing decree, well uh, it uh, will indicate uh, at the national level what is uh, the power of PV installations that has to be achieved by any region. Do you have similar experience where a project has been rejected just by not even reading the, the documents you, you, you file for? Pablo? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we're having that uh, on, a, on a daily basis. No, again, um, sometimes it's not, it's not completely clear um, all the information that you have to provide, especially when it comes to, to land, land use. You know, there is not a clear procedure about use of land. Um, and the reason is why is that this is very, very, very local. So um, every time you need to change and, and you don't have visibility on the process and you don't know what to do to change it. And once you change it, you don't know if you really need another paper for to get the building permit. So um, there has to be a clear picture on use of land for PV if we want to install um, 60 gigawatts a year. That cannot happen on a case-by-case -case basis because we, we're going to go crazy. And Andreas, um, the European Union is telling uh, countries to, to use go-to um, uh, go areas. Can you, because it's, it was for me so far <coughs> difficult to understand what are exactly these, these areas where they are they're already identified by, by governments. Maybe you can help us understand what are these areas. Yeah, so this is <clears throat> this is quite an uh, innovative and, um, and brave proposal, I think, from the European Commission, is to basically, as part of the renewables directive, mandate member states to look at go to identify go-to areas within two years after the entry in force of the regulation. Now, I think that's the problem. I think it's two years after the entry into force of the legislation, which I think is way way too late. This can be. This can go, this must go much, much faster. Um, and the go-to areas is actually a very useful way of uh, early on identifying areas in the country, most of artificial and non-nature impact, where renewables can be developed soon, exempting them from a project-based environmental impact assessment, but clearly being a no regrets, no conflict uh, zone that can be developed. Uh, so we certainly embrace that concept from the commission. Uh, and it's something that we just believe can go faster. But in the end, the local administration can always find a, a reason to say no. I mean, in the end, if there is no political decision, I mean, it, it will always be difficult to build big infrastructure. 
of course, I mean, there's no such a thing as imposing uh, mandates on, on, on the project level. So, of course, there will still be the role of the local permitting authority. But the innovation is also in the time constraints. So within a go-to zone, a permit can not take longer than one year, or at least the procedure. That can still be no, of course. But it cannot take longer than one year and even six months for projects of smaller size. Mm. But this, at the end, points to the general question behind it, because it has to do, at the end, with with the discussion in society about acceptance. So it's, um, Moritz, you are also yep. saying yes. I mean, so you, 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 cannot get a, you cannot get around that, of course. So, so mm. I don't think none of this is an either or. Yeah? So that's why I tend to, sorry to intervene because I know it's a problem, but I tend to engage strongly on the permitting details and the procedures for sure. But I think we need to be careful not to lose the bigger picture and as an industry also reach out yeah, to the public make sure that we as project developers as an industry commit to a code of conduct good practices that really engage not just from a talking point for our uh, shop point of view but also uh, allow the people to participate to what we're actually building yeah <clears throat> i i couldn't concur more with um, with you um agrees and um i think we should be very careful that we don't wish for uh, let's say a bulldozing through of permits. Um, after all, we should be very happy that we're living in a con in constitutional democracy here, and um, so that means that there is a due process. And at the end of the day, this means for our industry that we should a look for uh, technical and economical solutions that mitigate the land use issue that we're certainly running into. And um, secondly, make sure that we engage the local communities and um, not only try to shove it through, but really make sure that there is local buy-in. Maybe a positive, the, uh, massive expansion maybe a pot before we come to the next topic, because we want to move to the next topic. There's also positive news from Germany. When I talk to project developers, I hear that um, already a year or two years back, there was a lot of resistance in municipalities by the municipality councils and so on. But we hear from many sides that this has been solved. There, are not, there is not so much re resistance on a local level. It's more the administrative, an administrative process. But there's another hurdle we also have to challenge, which you have to talk about, isn't it? Exactly. It's supply chain, having right. enough modules and inverters, which is uh, an issue right now. Pablo, are there enough modules to make this happen? There will be enough modules in the in the next five, ten years? I, I, I hope there will be. I think that there will be. Uh, I'm I'm more worried about the origin of the modules rather from, from the, the quantity, no? I think that um, China can easily increase our capacity in order to to be able to serve our needs. The problem is that we see how the world works and geopolitics are, are very important. So if we want to install 60 gigawatts per year, uh, not controlling at all the supply chain within Europe, I think that it's a, it's a huge risk. Uh, my point of view, our point of view is that more than the quantity is the control of the supply chain and the volatility in the, in the, in the price and the availability, you know? But I think that technically the world can build the models that we need. But Moritz, uh, setting up a, a, a full supply chain in Europe may be more difficult than building solar parks, or what do you think? Well, I mean, first of all, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, again, I'm f concurring fully with uh, Pablo here, and I think we shouldn't uh, make the mistake that we replace one energy dependency, in this case on Russian gas, with another uh, dependency, uh, in this case on uh, Asian and in particular Chinese solar modules. Um, and um, so as Pablo said, it is very much about the origin of the modules. Um, and as we push as a whole continent this very ambitious project of energy transition, uh, we're basically guaranteeing the demand, right? And so it would be quite ironic that we're uh, basically guaranteeing the demand for a foreign industry, in this case, uh, a non-European PV, PV manufacturing value chain. So um, both in terms of energy independence and strategic independence, and also in terms of getting a fair share of the value creation back into Europe, I think we should very much uh, make huge efforts 
to get the TV manufacturing ecosystem uh, back to Europe. And so to answer your, your question, yes, I think it is absolutely feasible. The only question is, how do we get from today, where we basically have zero uh, PV industry or very small, uh, you know, just nascent bits of a PV industry, including ourselves, um, to a fully developed world scale uh, PV industry, including all the uh, suppliers and uh, you know, including all the materials that it requires, not only the main um, stream polysilicon wafer cell module, but also the films, the cables, the junction boxes, etc. So this is a hugely competitive uh, industrial ecosystem currently in, in uh, China, and it will require a lot of effort to bring that back to Europe, but I think it's absolutely inevitable. Dries, is politics doing enough to support these efforts? I recently spoke to a small European manufacturer who said, just give me some fiscal incentives and I can set up a 3 gigawatt factory. I don't know how much that could be true, but still, uh, are there incentives for manufacturing that could be really spur some growth? And, and there are also part of the solar strategy uh, by the European Commission a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, part of the Repower EU does indeed uh, includes a target of 20 gigawatts of solar manufacturing back to Europe in by 2025. Yeah, um, um, that is uh, sub supported by a new industrial alliance, a solar PV industrial alliance, which needs to be the driving uh, instrument to make that happen. The European Commission has experience with these kind of alliances from the battery side, the battery lines or the hydrogen side. Uh, so there's different ways to, to do it. And it's an indication of the new zeitgeist that we're in. Yeah? So industrial policy is back and uh, it was already back before uh, this new Russian uh, aggression. Uh, so I think we got three shocks in the last 10 years that make us realize that we need to build strategic resilience. But, but, to, but Ries, uh, does, that, does that a decent more, does that work with 20 gigawatts? I mean, um, I just looked to China and uh, I, I mean, Jinko, I think, wants to ramp up to 95 gigawatts. Trina probably has similar goals, also the others. Maya Boga is now setting up 1.4 gigawatts, I think. Once you can correct me and I don't know what your next target is, but can that be competitive with 20 gigawatts? Yeah, I'm quite that's sure exactly the right. Maybe let's turn to Maurits from the manufacturer side. Yeah, so it's, that's exactly the right question. So, um, yes, we are currently ramping to 1.4. That's our um, short-term goal. And our communicated longer-term goal is 7 gigawatts by 2027. That sounds rather large from today's point of view, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's still very meager. And even if you compare that to the... Um, and by the way, this is uh, serving the EU and the US market. So if you compare that to the 60 gigawatts uh, annual installations that we talked about in, in Europe, that is still just a drop in the ocean, right? Um, and so, yes, we absolutely need to massively scale and need to scale much faster. And while we are very happy to see the developments coming out of Brussels, we're also very happy to see um, sort of positive resonance to our messages um, here in Berlin, for example, um, we still fear that it's too little, too late in a sense that um, as an industry, we have to overcome this um, sort of burden or this, this hump that we need to get across initially. And we fear that even with the big demand that is now being triggered, that's not enough to scale the industry quickly enough. So, so we think that at this time, it doesn't require subsidies, but it requires capital um, in order to uh, achieve these industrial scales fast enough. Is there a way to, a, a positive outlook to this? I mean, that is now a bit more the realistic outlook. Trees? Yeah, so it's a, yeah, so this is part of the plan. Yeah, So the solar PV industrial lines will be linked to European funding and capital investments, uh, opportunities like the innovation funds. Um, there is also experience from the battery lines, as I mentioned, uh, to have public partner, uh, private partnerships, so very much in line with, uh, with what you were saying from my burger. So this kind of capital injection uh, to to build these things. And you were mentioning it. There is actually quite a lot of appetite to make investments in this direction if it can be de-risked and if that's uh, fresh capital can be made available. So the 20 gigawatt target is, uh, is is certainly achievable. It's of course not bringing the entire solar value chain back to Europe, yeah. But that's also I think the the, the new ones here, what we're talking about is strategic resilience uh, and, and, and not a full reshoring, of course, of the industry. 
then this that's I think uh, part of the the balance. Yeah, and if I can comment on that, so. Um, Yes, I mean, those are all very good instruments, and in particular, for example, the Innovation Fund. Um, but we need to be very mindful of what we need. And um, in order to fund innovative new technologies, that's great. But what we need currently is quite simply a massive scaling of today's technology. And it's just an the economical problem that the private sector cannot provide enough capital fast enough to really scale this, this industry. And... Um, so that's, while yes, we are cautiously optimistic about what we're seeing, and there's a lot of right approaches that we're seeing, we're still not quite sure if everybody has understood this sense of urgency, because it does require some time to set up certain industrial uh, activities. And so we need to start today. And this is really only comparable to, say, a moonshot exercise. I mean, if if we want to achieve those uh, build all targets, and if we want to make sure that a significant portion of those panels is actually made in Europe, that is a major, major effort, and we still need to step up the game from here. Mm. Yeah, maybe there's one point I was I, I heard several times. I mean, project developers are very happy about the high electricity prices which we have, but on the, because that really makes a business model also for solar. But on the other hand, more it's producers, can they live with these high energy prices? Short answer, because we have to come to a conclusion. That's, of course, the, the irony. Yes, we do need uh, energy as well, and it bites us. Yes. Okay. I think we come to the conclusion. It's um, we, we have raised a lot of topics. I think we had a very optimistic start with this. We, we can achieve the deployment on the production side. We are still waiting for the policy to answer. I mean, there are good movements in Brussels. I think we are still waiting a bit of movements of the German government, for example, on this issue. Um, I just want to finish the, this panel by letting you complete a sentence. I, I will read it now to you. Um, basically, I will read two sentences to you, and you should complete the last one. We want to make the goal of a clean and free Europe real in 2030, with all the necessary renewable power installed. Now comes the sentence to complete. The most, most important thing to do for me today is... That's, I see trees at the first, and then Moritz, and then Pablo. So you have to do. The most important thing I want to do today, or I have to do today, is? Is to reach the larger society. So you're saying yes, Moritz, but you have to say something different now. <laughs> Well, I, I would probably make that more specific, and uh, since this requires action today, I mean, while well, what Rhys uh, said is absolutely true, we need to um, address policymakers, and we need to make sure that policymakers understand the sense of urgency that I talked about before. That's what I'm working on every day currently. Pablo. I would add that what is important now is to, to align objectives among all the participants, all the stakeholders on the, on the land and permitting issue to provide a visibility on the, on the, on the process, on the development. Mm. Yes, I think my personal impression is that a lot of things are moving now. I mean, as Moritz mentioned beforehand, we are living in a democracy, so we cannot expect that everything works from today to tomorrow. It's a discussion in the society. We are part of this. We want to do this here as PV Magazine. I think it was a great, great panel. Thank you all. Dries Ake, Policy Director at Solar Power Europe. Pablo Collado, CEO for Northern and Central Europe at Iberdrola, which is doing basically everything from project development to supplying energy. And Moritz Borgmann, Chief Commercial Officer at Meyer Burger, who is setting up production in Europe. Please stay tuned. Our sustainability session will follow suit. Until now, the regulation for environmental, social, and governmental governance standards for solar companies seems more to be like a not-so-difficult formality. But this doesn't have to stay like this. My colleagues Becky Beats and Jonathan Gifford will discuss with really great panel and great experts they have found 
whether this will change and whether also the solar industry and also the EPCs and project developers will have to prepare. I mean, I think the message is in the title of the session, the sustainability bar is rising. Before this, our head of events, Frederike Egerer, will present some news and what you should know about the PV Magazine Roundtables Europe 2022. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to our Roundtables Europe 2022. I'm Friederike Egerer, Head of Events at PV Magazine, and I'm excited to welcome you to this event. On June 28th and 29th, you can expect a tightly packed program. We've invited over 60 experts from the European solar industry to discuss the future energy landscape. Our agenda frames the key issues for solar and battery energy storage and their role throughout the European economy. We have 10 exciting sessions curated by our PV Magazine editors, which you can see on the agenda. You can also create your own and add the most interesting ones to your own schedule. On this platform, you can also network with thousands of fellow industry peers. You can speed network during the breaks or set up a meeting one-on-one -on -one at a time that suits you via the People's tab. Or you can join the English, German, French or Spanish group discussions. Our regional editors are continuing the conversation off stage there and you can join them. Our partners have also added lots of information for you in the expo area. So go and check out their virtual booths to continue your industry deep dive with videos, articles and more. And are you as excited about the event as I am? Spread the excitement by using the dedicated hashtag RTU2022. So, see you on June 28th and 29th for the live event.